Hi, I'm Brother Guy Consolmagno. I'm the director of the Vatican Observatory. You can see me in this picture here. I'm the guy with the beard talking to my boss. All the different Jesuit priests and brothers who work at the Vatican Observatory, there's about a dozen of us, were had a special audience with the Pope a year ago. And here's where I'm giving him a copy of our annual calendar. I understand that you guys are learning about creation, both the creation lesson that's in Genesis and the scientific theory of creation. I hope you realize that the brilliant mathematician who first came up with the idea of the Big Bang also happened to be a Catholic priest, Georges Lemaitre. You can see him here first as a young man talking to Albert Einstein, and then later giving a lecture where he was teaching at the University of Louvain in Belgium. Lemaitre was not only a great physicist and mathematician, he was also a very wise priest. And he insisted that the Big Bang was not the same thing as the creation in Genesis. Now, Pope Pius XII, who's shown here visiting our observatory back in the 50s, was a great fan of science, and he listened carefully to what Lemaitre had to say. Why is the Big Bang something different from the let there be light of Genesis? To understand that, you need to look more carefully at Genesis itself. But I'll give you the essential point. Genesis is not a book of science about the creation of the universe. Genesis is a book of theology about God, who happens to be the creator. Our ideas of creation have changed many times over the thousands of years since Genesis was written, but our ideas of the creator have only gotten deeper without losing a thing of what Genesis says to us about the Creator. Genesis chapter 1 was written within a Jewish culture 2,500 years ago that was already well-established, experienced, and sophisticated in its relationship with God. From the internal evidence of the chapter, you can infer that it was probably written by the Jewish scholars in Babylon during the Babylonian captivity. This is about six centuries before Christ. That was that terrible time when the Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem and carried off all the smartest and wisest of the Jews to help them run their empire. As Pope Francis notes in his encyclical Laudato Si, the experience of the Babylonian captivity provoked a spiritual crisis, which led to a deeper faith in God. His creative omnipotence was given pride of place in order to exhort the people to regain their hope in the midst of their wretched predicament. Now, we know that Genesis was probably based on Babylonian science, which was, after all, the best science of the day, because you can find direct parallels in Genesis with the creation story of the Babylonians especially its descriptions, even its language of what we call nature, in the sense of how the elements of the universe are put together. The Genesis version of creation accepts the arrangement of heaven and earth assumed by the Babylonians, which was a flat disk with a dome overhead, separating the water above and the water below. Now, in the Babylonian creation story, the universe was the result of a fight between all these different gods, in particular the god Marduk and the dragon of watery chaos, Tiamat. Genesis actually uses the name of that dragon, Tiamat, as its root word for the chaos it describes in the opening verses of the chapter. In the Babylonian story, the dragon's corpse becomes the physical universe. To the Babylonians, the whole goal of creation was to lead to the city of Babylon. Now, in the Genesis story, though all of the elements of how the universe is put together are the same, that's where the similarities end. First of all, in Genesis, the creator is one, not many. Moreover, this creator God is already present when the story begins in the beginning. God is already there before there's a universe. This removes this God, the God of Abraham, from any of those pantheons of nature gods that you'd find in all the other countries surrounding Israel. The creator is not a replacement for the laws and forces of nature. The creator, instead, is the one who accounts for the existence of these laws and forces in the first place. It also means that you can learn to know the personality of the Creator 
in the timeless, and elegant, and beautiful character of the laws that describe nature, the laws that give the universe the freedom to act in the ways that might be good, maybe are not so good. A second lesson from the opening of Genesis is that creation is neither the carcass of a defeated dragon or the accidental result of other activities by all these nature deities. Rather, creation occurs not by accident, but through the deliberate decision of the one God who was there before creation, who acted alone. And again, this is what Pope Francis says in Laudato Si. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, he says, quoting Psalm 33. And then he goes on to say, this tells us that the world came about as the result of a decision, not from chaos or chance, and this exalts it all the more. The creating word expresses a free choice. The universe didn't emerge as the result of some arbitrary omnipotence or to show off force or desire for self-assertion. And in this point is emphasized in the systematic way that creation is described in Genesis you know, chapter 1, where it's described step by step, day by day. We're told that there's a system to how the universe works. Its working is not the collection of the arbitrary whims of a bunch of nature deities. And even more striking, we're told at every step that creation is good. The creator is not a spiritual entity who says the physical universe is dangerous and inherently evil and sinful, and we should all just be spiritual people. No, creation is inherently good. There is evil, but evil is the lack of a good that ought to be there. It is not something independent created by you know, God or some other deity. What does it mean? Well, it's, it's the difference between saying that chocolate is evil because it's going to make you fat, or chocolate is good, even sacred, because it's a foretaste of God's goodness. And of course, if you eat too much, you get sick, but that's not any reason to never taste it. It's the reason to use it properly, the good that ought to be there. What's more, creation occurs in a way that everybody can see. Nothing is hidden. In his homily on Easter Saturday night in 2012, Pope Benedict the XVI noted, at the beginning of the account of creation, where the church hears is, God said, let there be light. What is the creation account saying here? Not that there was a big bang, who knows? But what it does say is that everything is happening in the light. To, to continue what uh, Pope Benedict says, light makes life possible, it makes encounter possible, it makes communication possible, it makes knowledge, access to reality and to truth possible. And so far as it makes knowledge possible, it makes freedom and progress possible. And he points out this isn't the same as the light from the sun, because, you know, the sun isn't made for several more days. This is a light that says that everything in creation is done in a way and in a place where we can see it. Finally, where the Babylonian creation story is aimed at promoting the city of Babylon as the logical climax of creation, Genesis has a very different destination. What's the ultimate day of creation? What's the ultimate thing created? It's the seventh day, the Sabbath, the day of rest. To quote Genesis, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing, and so on the seventh day he rested from his work. And then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from the work of creating he'd done. And you can see from how the Jews interpreted this that the seventh day isn't just a day of idleness. It's a day of prayer and contemplation of God. Now, the work of the other six days is the work you have to do to survive, you know, producing and preparing and distributing food and clothing and shelter, and those are all good. But contemplating nature as a way of engaging the Creator is different. It's a form of prayer. We human creatures are more than just animals who only live to eat and sleep. 
the spiritual and intellectual aspects of the human person are the pinnacle of what makes us human. In other words, God's calling us to be astronomers, or poets, or artists, or whatever we do that makes us more deeply spiritual and intellectual and human. Now, the interesting thing is that this message of the story of Genesis stays true even as our understanding of the universe grows. God creates the universe, which means creating space and time and the laws of physics that make space and time possible and the laws of physics that make creation possible. God's creation isn't just something that happened in the beginning. God is supernatural, which means God is outside of nature, outside of space and time. And so God's creation occurs at every place and every time, maintaining and sustaining existence itself. And that's why the one attitude we can never take towards science is fear, as if knowledge was a threat to God. And that's what St. John Paul II was trying to get at when he spoke to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences back in 1996 with the talk, Truth Cannot Contradict Truth. Science doesn't replace God. Rather, it reveals that God is more amazing than we could ever have realized. After all, the writer of Genesis insisted that God made everything that could be seen, and they thought that meant the flat earth with the dome and the waters above and below the dome. Now today, if we recognize that the universe includes all of the stars and all of the galaxies extending for 13.8 billion light years in every direction, and that's only the part we can see, how much bigger we recognize God to be. <laughs>